Welcome to the next in a series of webinars brought to you by PKF Texas. We were pleased to welcome moderator Chip Schweiger, Valerie Fry, and Miriam Ruzik of PKF Texas, along with Grace Stratton of DLA Piper to discuss what's next for 2021 accounting and SEC reporting updates. This presentation was recorded live on December 3rd, 2020 as a Zoom webinar. All information was accurate and current at that time. Those viewing this recording now are not eligible to receive CPE credit from PKF Texas. If you have questions regarding this webinar or future PKF Texas webinars, please feel free to email us at jlemansky at pkftexas.com and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. All right. Well, welcome to What's Next for 2021 Accounting and SEC Reporting Updates. Thank you all for joining us today. Just a few housekeeping things. Everyone who attends this live webinar today will receive CPE credit administered by PKF Texas. In addition to attendance, you will need to answer one of the polling questions the panelists have prepared today in order to be eligible for CPE. The panelists are happy to answer questions throughout the presentation in addition to the Q&A time at the end. Please submit your question through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and indicate who you would like to answer your question. I will now turn it over to Chip Schweiger, our moderator, who will introduce you to our panelists. Chip, take it away. Great, thank you, Jen, and good morning to everyone. Uh, so we've got three great panelists this morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce you to our first panelist, Valerie Fry, who is a senior manager at PKF Texas. She has extensive experience in external audits in both publicly owned and privately held businesses, quarterly filings of public entities, and audits of internal controls over financial reporting required under Sarbanes-Oxley. And before I turn it over to Valerie, we're gonna start with our first polling question of the morning. So for polling question number one, what is your position with your company? Are you the CEO, CFO, controller, accounting department, or other? And if you'll just, uh, if you'll just put your votes in there, we'll give everyone a few moments. And if you hold more than one position, I guess pick the best one. All right, let's see. All right, pretty pretty interesting results. We've got a little bit of a blend of everybody, but mostly CFOs, controllers, and a lot of others. So uh, we're looking forward to having a good discussion for everyone this morning. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Valerie uh, for her section. Valerie, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, Chip. Um, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with all of you, even though we are remote. I'm going to be doing a high-level overview of what the FASB has been up to so far in 2020. Uh, nothing too crazy so far this year, which is always a nice change after some of the recent updates. All right, so let's dive into the 2020 ASUs that we have so far. If you want to go to the next slide? Um, the first set of 2020 ASUs, as you'll see here, are just general codification improvements. There's nothing very interesting with any of these. It's just part of the FASB's ongoing cleanup of the codification, cross-referencing, wording tweaks, citing, stuff like that. All right, our next set of ASUs relate to timing deferrals. So the ASU has deferred the timing of a few different standards that are coming out. One portion of ASU 202002 related to leases has a very narrow scope timing deferral, and it refers, it, it applies only to companies that are defined as public business entities solely because their financial statements are included in the filings of an SEC filer, so it's very narrow scope. ASU 202005, however, defers both RevRec and leases. Um, but it's applicable to entities who've not adopted those standards yet, since SEC filers should have adopted both those standards before 2020. This primarily impacts private companies who would not have adopted yet. And then finally, ASU 202011 defers to the effective date of the slide, the um, adoption of ASU 2018-12, which relates to targeted improvements associated with long duration contracts that falls under topic 944 and in insurance. So a few timing deferrals. There's also been some SEC alignment changes that they've made um, going to the next slide. So the second half or 
the first half of ASU 2020-02 related to topic 326 adds an SEC paragraph <clears throat> to align with an SEC staff bulletin. And they've also made changes to align debt disclosures in topic 470 with SEC issuances. And in this one, the SEC has actually amended guidance to reduce some of the reporting requirements related to guaranteed debt security offerings. So that's actually a happy change and companies that are impacted can take advantage of that on or before the effective date in January, 2021. All right, going to the next slide, we have a few other ASUs. The first ASU of the year is just to clarify the interaction of the accounting between the listed subtopics. And it is primarily focused on when you may have instruments or securities that apply under multiple multiple layers of guidance and which guidance do you follow when? ASU 2020-04 for reference rate reform is intended to help with those disclosures. It provides some optional expedience and exceptions so that when entities can meet certain criteria, they can simplify some of what they need to do in that area. And that's applicable from the time the ASU is issued until the end of 2022. ASU 2006 is probably the most substantive of the ASUs that's been issued so far this year. It does several things. One is that it reduces the accounting models that will be available for dealing with convertible preferred debt and convertible preferred stock. So this should reduce the instances in which embedded conversion features in those convertible instruments would be accounted for separately from the host contract. They also looked at contracts that an entity has in its own equity under derivatives accounting, and they have reduced the conditions or reduced the number of conditions that have to be met in order for entities to account for those contracts as equity, as opposed to an asset or a liability. The ASU also includes some simplification on how certain instruments are treated for diluted EPS and provides additional guidance on disclosures. So if you have instruments of that nature, there's a lot going on in that ASU. It would probably be worth checking into that in a little more detail. And finally, ASU 202007 for not-for-profit entities simply updates presentation requirements for those types of companies. So it doesn't have any particularly significant impact for most public filers. Um, so that is, if you're keeping track at home, they're not in, in order by issue and state, but that's only 11 ASU so far this year and not a whole lot of significant changes in 2020. Um, so with that, I guess we can take a look at what the FASB has been putting out related to COVID-19. All right, so for COVID-19, like everyone else, the FASB has created its own fancy little separate web page just to track whatever it's been putting out related to that specifically and to give a reference point for everyone to look at. So we have a, the link included on the slide. They haven't actually done very much that is COVID specific. They've talked a lot, but they haven't put out a lot of new information. So one of their responses is they, they have delayed some effective dates. So they've issued ASUs related to that. That's the deferral of RevRec and leases that primarily impacts private companies, as well as the deferral related to certain um, improvements for topic 944 related to insurance. So not a lot of deferrals yet. They've also put out some additional guidance on applying the taxonomy, and that's really to help entities figure out how they want to describe and present their COVID-19 disclosures um, and may be helpful in figuring out your wording, figuring out your line item descriptions when you're putting that information together. They've put out an educational paper on debt restructurings and modifications. It is not new guidance or new information, but it is ten intended to assist companies who may be applying this for the first time or applying it with a much higher volume of occurrence than they've dealt with in the past. They felt like this was an area that might need more focus with some of the COVID-19 challenges people are dealing with. And finally, the FASB did put out some specific guidance specific to COVID-19 and responded to some very kind of targeted specific scope questions related to both leases and hedge accounting. If you go to the next slide. All right, so for leases, with all of the economic disruption, business shutdowns, et cetera, that happened related to COVID-19 and related to the attempts to you know, take precautions and, and protect people, 
there's, there's been a huge impact on businesses and this has resulted in a lot of lease concessions in certain areas and certain industries. Now under both 840 and 842, depending on whether companies have adopted the new standard yet, there is specific guidance for lease modifications that has to be followed. It's multi-step, it can be cumbersome to work through. So if you have a high volume of concessions, that may be painful. Um, so the FASB received the question as to whether or not COVID-19 lease concessions needed to be accounted for following that lease modification accounting guidance in the standards. And the FASB said that not necessarily, if, the if there is not a substantial increase to the rights of the lessor or the obligations of the lessee, the FASB has stated that entities do not have to follow the full modification guidance. Instead, they can assume that the enforceable rights and obligations for those concessions existed in the lease and they can move forward based on that assumption. So it just cuts out some of that headache and some of that work. It's, it's essentially a practical expedient for COVID-19 specific issues. Now entities don't have to take that. They can, they can keep following lease modification accounting if they really want to. Um, and they don't have to make a blanket election. The FASB did say you can use this or you can follow lease modification accounting, but you're gonna need to have consistent treatment if those leases have similar characteristics or in similar circumstances. So there would need to be a clear delineation if a company was picking one option for one lease and one option for another. Along with this, the FASB also provided some additional thoughts on accounting for deferrals in this circumstance and ended with one of their favorite reminders that you should definitely disclose material activity. All right, so that's what they focused on for their lease accounting guidance. For hedge accounting, the FASB focused on questions related to challenges in the timing and predictability of forecasted transactions. So in this context, the forecasted transaction is referring to the event that is being hedged. So if we take a very simple form of a hedge of an interest rate swap that a company may use to fix the interest rate of a variable rate note, the event being hedged would be the loan interest payment <clears throat> or forecast a transaction or the event being hedged is the loan interest payment. So that's the type of transaction that the FASB is referring to in this context when they talk about forecasted transactions. So one question arose related to timing delays. Now there's specific guidance in the standards for certain types of hedging transactions um, that there is a defined timing window for when that transaction needs to occur if it's not probable that it will occur within that window, you can't really follow the hedge accounting treatment. However, the standards do allow, allow for rare exceptions where you may have to look at a different timing window. And of course, the FASB was asked if COVID-19 is a rare exception and they said, yes, it is. So they said that judgment is still necessary in evaluating if the time frame is reasonable, but instead of purely looking at that narrow scope within the standard, you would consider the nature of the transaction, the nature of your business, and how significant COVID-19 has disrupted things. So essentially they've given guidance on how to apply judgment in that scenario for the rare circumstance of COVID-19. If that transaction is not possible in a reasonable time frame, you would still not apply the exception whether or not COVID-19 has had an impact. The second question was specific to when a forecast is missed. So when an entity anticipates a particular hedge transaction and then is wrong. So under hedge accounting, companies that have missed forecast have to evaluate whether or not there is a pattern of the forecast being missed and a pattern of them anticipating and being incorrect about their plans for the hedging. In those circumstances, the guidance says that that creates uncertainty about an entity's ability to predict and they may be forced to discontinue hedge accounting. So COVID-19 obviously created a lot of unexpected economic challenges and would have made it very difficult in certain circumstances for companies to accurately predict certain forecasted transactions. So they asked whether or not a forecast that was missed because of the impacts of COVID-19 needed to be considered as part of a pattern of missed forecasts that might force them to discontinue hedge accounting. And the FASB has said no. If you have genuinely missed a forecast because of COVID-19, 
You do not need to consider that in the pattern of missed forecasts that might, might contribute to that change. You are going to have to use judgment to evaluate if this was genuinely missed because of COVID-19 and we're not changing any of this, just the disclosure guidance. You still need to make the appropriate disclosures, but we're not gonna necessarily let this cut you out of hedge accounting. We don't think that the standards were taking into account or thinking of the type of situation we're in right now. All right, so that's what the FASB is focused on so far. It will definitely be interesting to see if they put out anything new as we go through the rest of the year and move into the heavy financial reporting season at the beginning of 2021. Um, but with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Chip. Thank you, Valerie. It's, uh, we certainly live in interesting times, right? And it's, uh, it's nice to see that the FASB is, uh, and the standard setters are giving some relief and some guidance uh, as it relates to all these issues during this pandemic. Uh, Valerie, thank you for your, for your time this morning and the information. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone in the audience, uh, as Jen had said, the panelists are happy to answer questions throughout the presentation in addition to Q&A time at the end. So just remember to submit your question through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and indicate who you would like uh, to answer that question. And next up, uh, I wanna introduce Miriam Ruziak. Miriam is a manager at PKF Texas and she has extensive experience with financial statement audit and review services for <clears throat> SEC reporting companies as well as audit, review, and compilation services for private and not-for-profit entities. So with that, Miriam, I will turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Chip. Good morning, everyone. I'm hopefully not going to bore you too much with the SEC updates. Uh, they just had a few updates in terms of final rules issued and uh, their COVID-19 reliefs. And the big thing was the Rule SK modernization. So I'll go quickly over some of the SEC updates. Uh, they issued two final rules, one on amending the accredited investors definition, which they did in August 2020. Uh, they also had a uh, publication or submission of quotations without specified information in September 2020. Uh, those were pretty uh, minor rules uh, that were finalized, so they didn't really have a huge impact on the, uh, the rules. The accredited investors, they basically uh, refined some of the uh, wording around who qualifies as an accredited investor. Um, publications or submissions of quotations without specified information, they really wanted to tighten up the rules around that and make sure that people, uh, especially the um, underwriters and uh, companies who were issuing um, quotations of stock were issuing those with specific information that would enable uh, investors to make um, good decisions in their investing. Uh, they have upcoming proposed rules on the earnings releases versus quarterly report filings, and that's expected in the second quarter of 2021. And so this was kind of a, a big change for SEC filers because what they are proposing is changing quarterly reports, the traditional 10Q, to something that's more like an earnings release instead of the full 10Q with the footnotes and the financial statements. So this is kind of an interesting proposal for them, but they've been batting this around with comments and uh, really thinking about this. So this isn't something that's finalized. This is something that they've been proposing and really looking at for quite a while. I think I first heard about this maybe last year sometime, late last year. So this isn't something that's new, but it's definitely something that's been kicked around for a while. So the next thing is the COVID-19 release. And early in the COVID-19 uh, shutdowns, they had issued some reliefs for public companies where they allowed filing extensions, especially for the 331 and uh, 10Qs. Some of those, especially for smaller companies, that was a really big relief because they were allowed to extend their filings to June 30th rather than the 45-day filing. However, the SEC said that because we've been doing this for quite a while, they're not going to allow any additional filing extensions. 
However, they're going to continue allowing shareholder meetings to be in a flexible format. So virtual, in-person, hybrid. So they're no longer going to require people to have that in-person format for all of their shareholder meetings. They're going to make it more flexible for people, especially since there have been a lot of delays in the Postal Service, um, or not in the Postal Service, in uh, being able to travel. Uh, people can't take flights, people aren't able to go in and out of cities. So it's really a benefit for companies. They can still have those shareholder meetings and won't have to delay those. The other thing, and this has been a really big benefit for broker dealer companies, especially that require manual signatures under rule 302B, uh, those are still on hold. So because a lot of these companies require manual signatures and delays in the postal service have really um, put a cramp in that, they've continued to put that on hold so that people don't have to go into the office or mail all this stuff in, in order to be compliant with those rules. So next, we'll go into the big thing, which is the SEC modernization. So this is a big deal for the SEC. They're modernizing rule SK. And so what they're trying to do here is really streamline the disclosures so that companies aren't trying to cram a lot of disclosures in and have redundant disclosures and um, have disclosures that are in multiple places or disclosures that don't make sense. The boilerplate disclosures they really want to make sure that companies are having robust disclosures without the uh, kind of boilerplate nonsensical disclosures where they just sort of put one or two sentences but don't really have the information that investors need. So what they've tried to do is make sure that investors have the information but in a more concise format. So the first one is the selected financial data and this one is related to, well, let me go into when this is effective first. I'm kind of skipping ahead here. So the rules were adopted and announced in on November 19th, 2020. But because of the way the SEC cha rule changes are in effect, it has to go into the Federal Register, and then it's effective 60 days after that. So these are expected to be effective beginning in the second quarter of 2021. So now we'll go into the actual rules. So selected financial data is one of the first ones and item 301 disclosure requirements. These are related to um, trend disclosures and how many periods that these companies have to, um, have to disclose in terms of the selected financial information. Uh, the SEC decided that they want to really refine these and pare these down. So, <clears throat> if the information is already included in MDNA, they don't want companies to restate that and rehash all of that stuff in the selected financial data. So what they're saying here is that you've already got this information, you don't need to put it in the second place. So that uh, item 301 has been eliminated. The next one is the supplementary financial information. So this is another area where they've just streamlined these disclosures. So item 302A requires, uh, changes the requirement so that it's, the disclosure is only required when there are one or more retrospective changes that pertain to statements of comprehensive income. And that's within the two most recent financial uh, fiscal years. And then in any subsequent interim periods that you have the financials included in the financial statements. So these require any of the registrants to provide explanations for material changes and disclose summarized financial information related to comprehensive income and earnings per share for each of those affected quarterly periods and the fourth quarter. So you would have to include any material changes and all of the reasons for those changes, not just saying that there's a change for each of the quarters so Q1, Q2, Q3, plus the fourth quarter. And there's also amendments to Rule 1-02BB, and that clarifies that the disclosure of summary financial information may vary to conform to the nature of the entity's business. So they really want companies to ensure that 
investors know that this summary financial information is going to change based on the nature of the entity's business. It's not just a standard financial information. Okay, so the next one is on MDNA. And so they really wanted to restructure and streamline MDNA. So this is where some of the biggest changes are. Uh, the biggest ones are making sure that investors are looking at <clears throat> the company from management's perspective. They're not just looking at superficial changes. The first one is amending item 303A, and this is gonna make changes to material information relevant to the assessment of financial condition and results of the operation. So this is gonna have evaluation of amounts and certainty of cash flows from operations and from outside sources. Companies are also gonna have to disclose <clears throat> material events and uncertainties that are known to management that are reasonably likely to cause financial information that is going to change in the future based on future operating results or future financial condition. And so this includes both matters that have had a material impact on reported operations and matters that are reasonably likely based on management's assessment to have a material impact on future operations. So management is going to have to assess these uh, issues. They're going to have to look at things and really understand what's going to happen, what's going to be reasonably likely. And so I know reasonably likely is kind of a fuzzy assessment, but the SEC wants to get away from this idea that management is just looking at things on a superficial level and disclosing uh, basic issues. They want to really make these disclosures more robust and have investors have a better understanding of what's going on. So I know auditors have a unique view that we can look at future cash flows in the audit binder and really see what's going on for things like going concern and from our perspective, but once it gets to the financial statements, investors may only see something like there's no issues that would impact the company's ability to go forward as a going concern. So the SEC wants to have companies put in more information related to that. <clears throat> companies are also going to have to put in narrative discussion of material changes. And what they want to do is put reasons underlying. And so this means that you're going to have what caused these material changes rather than there's just this change that happened. So for example, um, we had this asset transaction that caused uh, revenues to go up because we had better equipment. Well, they want more information to go into the financial statements based on these reasons underlying. So more information is gonna go into uh, MDNA. Item 303B, so this is going to impact the segment information. So this would include product lines as an example of subdivisions as in a registrant's business. So this could be an area of relevant disclosure for companies. This isn't going to be a required area, but this is going to be an area that companies could look at for a potential um, area for <coughs> disclosure. And uh, I'm just gonna quickly go over some of these other areas. They're not as big as MDNA, but MDNA is the one thing that I wanted to focus on the most. So capital resource disclosures, these are going to be disclosure requ disclosures required for material cash requirements. So this is gonna include commitments for capital expenditures, anticipated source of funds needed to require your cash needed to satisfy your cash requirements and the general purpose of your cash requirements. And so these are gonna be um, expenditures that may not be capital investments in PPE and PPE, your fixed assets and those kinds of things, but they may be increasingly important to the company. So these are gonna be areas that you're gonna to have to really increase your disclosures in. Uh, results of operations, 
these are going to be another area that management is going to have to make an assessment on that reasonably likely threshold. And what's going to cause material changes in the relationship between your costs and revenues? Um, <clears throat> Your off balance sheets arrangements, these are gonna, this is gonna be expanded to provide a more principles-based approach. So I know with the increasing alignment with IFRS, the FASB AFC rules have gone more towards a principles-based approach. So the SEC is kind of dipping their waters, dipping their toes into that water. So off balance sheet arrangements are doing, going more into that area. Your contractual obligations table, there's some more changes here as well. You're going to see amended rules related to disclosures of the material cash requirements. <clears throat> and uh, they're really going to want more discussion here rather than just putting a table in there. So I know a lot of companies tend to put a table that shows the contractual obligations for your debt, your interest, your long-term and short-term leases. And so what they want here is more of a disclosure and discussion of what's going on here. Critical accounting estimates. This is gonna try and eliminate disclosures between your significant accounting policies and the financial statements and have a more focus on measurement of your uncertainties. <clears throat> Interim period discussions, these are going to have the flexibility reflected in the interim reports. So this is going to have the flexibility that lets you tailor your analysis relevant to your business cycle. So for business cycles that fluctuate during the year, you're going to be able to tailor all of your discussions based on that. So there's going to be the option to provide comparative data between the current quarter and the immediately preceding quarter. So Q3 versus Q2, Q2 versus Q1, rather than comparing specifically to Q3 this year versus Q3 last year, Q2 this year versus Q2 last year. Uh, safe Harbor, this is on the next slide. <clears throat> safe Harbor for forward-looking information. Uh, specific rules related to this are being eliminated. All Safe Harbor information they're expecting this to be incorporated into larger MD&A discussion. So they don't want to duplicate any of this information between the safe harbor and the MD&A. They just want to combine, excuse me, they want to combine all of this so that it's all in one place. Company um, investors don't have to jump back and forth. And for smaller reporting companies, this was a um, seemingly minor change, but what this does the elimination of 303D and replacing with 303B, this uh, really allows more streamlined <clears throat> approaches to your disclosures. And what 303D had was the uh, contractual obligations table included in it. And so this allows the smaller reporting companies a relief from some of those detailed disclosures that were more relevant to larger reporting companies, but not so much to smaller reporting companies. So that's it for the modernization rules. Uh, again, most of the focus here was on trimming down your disclosures, making them more relevant, and uh, trying to duplicate the, uh, uh, trying to eliminate duplication between the different areas in the reports. So this is, Miriam, this looks like a game changer to me. I mean, a lot, there's a lot of information here and a lot of uh, changes that registrants need to be aware of. So uh, thank you for, for your time and thank you for walking us through that, appreciate it. All right, let's go to a polling question. Uh, we've got this one, uh, now that we've talked about COVID-19 and the SEC and FASB releases, uh, have you been following the SEC and FASB releases and guidance pertaining to COVID-19 and its ongoing impact? Uh, so you got yes, uh, all over it, no, don't care about it, or following it sometimes. So if you'll just click in your answers there. We'll give everyone just a, a minute more to get them in. We're getting pretty good response. 
All right, let's see. Uh, okay, 23% said yes. Uh, as you can see, 36% said no, and 41% said some. And, and I suspect that's probably where a lot of us are feeling, at least I know I am feeling a little bit of a COVID exhaustion with all the news, but uh, thank you for your responses there. All right, our next panelist is Grace Stratton. Gray is a partner in DLA Piper's Regulatory Compliance and Global Investigations Practice Groups, and he's also a formal civil enforcement prosecutor with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. So happy to have him here today, and Gray, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Chip, and thanks everyone for joining. It's good to be with you virtually today. Um, my presentation is really a compliment to Miriam's who focused on SEC rulemaking in 2020, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the enforcement front, which is an area where the SEC always um, regulates and regulates heavily, although I will tell you that um, it's no secret that the current commission has been very pro-business, the current administration has been very pro-business, so you've seen a little bit less enforcement in 2020 and in the past four years, and we'll see if that changes going forward. If we can go to the next slide. So here's our agenda uh, for our conversation today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about an overview and some of the trends that we've seen in enforcement uh, from the SEC in 2020. The whistleblower program continues to be a key feature of the enforcement division. And we'll talk about that. We're gonna go over some accounting and disclosure cases that have come out in 2020. Those are always helpful kind of benchmarks and reminders of areas where companies and, and boards need to focus their controls. We'll talk about cooperation. Um, SEC enforcement in particular continues to rely on a carrot and stick approach and cooperation is the primary carrot. They offer to companies to effectively help them investigate accounting and auditing issues, self-disclose, remediate issues, uh, cooperate with the SEC enforcement division in, in hopes of obtaining some kind of a fav favorable resolution. So we'll talk about some examples of that from 2020, and we'll talk about some key takeaways from the year, some lessons learned, and then hopefully if we have a little bit of time, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about what a new commission might look like, what some of their priorities might be under a new administration. All right, so next slide if you would, Jen. And one more. Okay, so as you can see here um, in the bullets, these are really the key areas of enforcement focus for the SEC in 2020. And these are um, really not new areas. These are continually focused on year over year. So we saw a number of cases in offering fraud focused on misconduct by investment advisors and broker dealers. Financial fraud continues to be a key cornerstone of the program market manipulation, insider trading, and overseas bribery that would relate to a violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Next slide. Okay, so this is, I think, a really key trend line, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, um, but it relates very heavily to the whistleblower program. Um, SEC keeps track of the statistic they call tips, complaints, and referrals. And these are effectively all of the sources of the SEC's investigation from outside the agency. Of course, the agency undertakes its own analytical procedures, um, its own compliance examinations, and those result in a number of um, internal investigations being generated at the agency. But a lot of information comes to the agency from outside sources. And that's really reflected in this measurement of tips, complaints, and referrals. And the first two categories in this large bucket, tips and complaints, are interesting because uh, these are sources of information that derive from whistleblowers. Okay, and it's no longer the case that whistleblowers are um, commonly or always found inside the company that the SEC may investigate. It used to be very much the case that the SEC would typically get whistleblower complaints from an insider. Right. Um, and now what you see in, in the SEC and the enforcement division in particular is a lot of these um, tips are coming in from outside of the company that would ultimately be investigated. They're coming from the street. They're coming from analysts. They may be coming from a short position, someone who has uh, an incentive to um, encourage an SEC investigation of a particular company. 
and all whistleblowers have an incentive to um, incite an investigation from the Dodd-Frank Act and its award um, incentive mechanism whereby a whistleblower can stand to receive a 10 to 30% award on any recovery by the SEC for a valid tip provided. So even these tips coming from the street, coming from analysts, people who are doing their own analytical procedures, if that information is considered by the SEC to be new, useful, something they wouldn't have otherwise uh, generated on their own, they will consider that a whistleblower tip eligible for a 10 to 30% award. So this chart really shows the significance and the increasing significance of whistleblower tips to the SEC's enforcement program. What you're looking at now is around 25,000 tips coming in in the, um, the, 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 the plot um, on the far right of the chart on your screen, that's 2020 and you see a trend line going up. So not only are they getting a lot of tips from outside the agency and pursuing a lot of those tips, but that trend line is increasing. We can speculate as to why perhaps tips were down in 2019. Um, and we'd have to speculate again as to why they're up in 2020, the year of COVID. Maybe people had more time on their hands. Maybe people had a greater financial incentive or rationale for trying to pursue one of these cases. Nonetheless, the trend is obvious, it's going up. And these tips resulted in about 1,200 new cases being opened by the Enforcement Division in 2020. That was a 10% increase year over year from 2019. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so, all right, this is our um, last, I think, um, Texas CPE polling question. And the question is, in which of the following subject areas did the SEC bring the most cases in 2020? We have insider trading, public company reporting and disclosure, broker-dealer cases, and market manipulation cases. So tell us what you think. And um, Jen, let me know when we have the answers. Looks like the most popular was public company reporting and disclosures. Okay, all right. You, you, you accurately picked up on the theme of our webinar today. Well done. Um, and, and I will tell you, if we go to the next slide, um, public company reporting, audit, and accounting disclosures um, continue to be an absolute bedrock of enforcement division activity and enforcement division cases. And lest you think I've misled you, um, this is actually the third uh, most common case from the enforcement division in 2020. However, if you look at the first category in this chart at the very, very top, those are securities offering cases. I will tell you that a significant portion of those security securities offering cases also involve misstatements and disclosure, uh, mis alleged misleading disclosures that are similar to, or at least analogous to those issues that are in the issuer reporting, audit and accounting case category. So all of those cases together uh, relating to accounting, auditing, issuer disclosures, alleged misleading disclosures, et cetera, are in 2020 and in almost every year, one of the top one, two, or three types of cases the SEC will bring. Very, very significant um, feature of the enforcement division. The other cases, um, I think we've talked about the kinds of cases the SEC brought in 2020, so we can move on to the next slide. And again. Okay, a little bit more on the whistleblower program and, and really the significance of this program. As you can see, here um, in 2020, in addition to um, some of the rulemaking that Miriam was talking about, and I agree absolutely with Miriam and Chip that the, the modification of Reg SK, and in particular, the um, modernization of the MDNA section of the reports was the most significant rulemaking from 2020. In addition, there was some rulemaking that will, I think, accelerate and has already accelerated some of the whistleblower program. 
processes. And, and part of this is, is a bit opaque um, to us because some of this um, was internal rulemaking that the SEC undertook in 2020 to really speed up their process of reviewing whistleblower complaints and tips, paying out whistleblower complaints and tips, providing some additional certainty to those who are submitting um, complaints and tips, whistleblowers in terms of what they would be paid. They basically set in place a presumption that if you are um, pursuing a whistleblower tip, you've submitted it, you're eligible for an award of five million or less, you're gonna be presumed to receive the full amount or the maximum amount possible under Dodd-Frank, which would be 30%. So additional incentives to whistleblowers in that respect. Um, and we also see, as I mentioned um, already, an increase in filings and, and enforcement actions resulting from the increased whistleblower intake. But we also see additional awards and additional uh, money being given to um, whistleblowers. And so you see already in 2020, we've had 315 preliminary awards granted to whistleblowers, 200 final awards. Both are very, very significant percentage increases over 2019, 175 million in awards in total given to whistleblowers. And then lastly, you'll see in that final bullet, a single whistleblower received an award of 115 or 114 million rather um, uh, for a single case. And that's the largest whistleblower award the SEC has ever given. And um, that's not just the normal case that gets you to 115 million dollar payout. This at a 10 to 30 percent recovery has to be one of the biggest cases of 2020. It probably would have been Wells Fargo or the um, Erickson um, FCPA bribery case um, because um, those were 500 million and a billion dollar resolution respectively. Um, and, and that information about, you know, who was it what company were they with? What information did they pro provide? That's all um, confidential by statute. So, so we're left to speculate as to what case that might have related to. But nonetheless, huge award and clearly an incentive for that whistleblower as well as others. If we can go to the next slide. And again. So um, here I've just kind of listed out some of the key cases relevant to this conversation. I'm not going to uh, go through all of these. I'm gonna call out a few that I think are most relevant to this group, to this conversation and can serve as exemplars and um, areas to focus your controls and your conversations from an accounting perspective. They're divided into really two categories. And these are two categories that the SEC themselves have focused on and highlighted. And these are financial statement uh, misstatements um, a lot of revenue recognition we saw in this category. We'll talk about a couple. And then non-GAAP metrics continue to be a feature of the enforcement program. So looking at a couple of these, um, SCANA, for example, uh, that is a South Carolina-based power generation company. And, and they, um, interestingly, were developing two large nuclear facilities and those were the kinds of facilities that companies in the U.S. haven't built for a long, long time. Um, and, and so as a result, there were significant government incentives to that construction. I think a billion dollar each for two, um, two proposed nuclear power plants. These would have been given to SCANA by way of federal tax credits. OK, and SCANA did um, a very, very large capital raise during the course of construction, particularly in the early days, as you can imagine, for a capital project of this size. And what they were telling investors was, uh, number one, we're conducting um, diligence and we are going to um, construct these uh, nuclear facilities. We are eligible once they started construction, we are eligible for these billion dollar tax credits. We have a construction schedule and we are meeting that construction schedule. We are on pace to receive these tax credits by a date certain. Okay, and if you think about it in a very, very large capital construction project, how often does your actual construction actually track step by step by step your scheduled construction? It's very, very rare, particularly in a construction project as complex as a nuclear facility. OK, so their representations were deemed misleading when they were not actually on schedule. 
uh, day by day, week by week, et cetera, when their disclosures seem to suggest that they were. Ultimately, those nuclear power plants were scrapped, giving regulators and plaintiffs, um, plaintiff shareholders an opportunity to look back through hindsight at those disclosures and say, those were not accurate. Um, you were not pacing uh, your schedule to make those, um, to make those bonds and, and um, tax credits uh, eligible. Okay, so trap for the unwary on construction projects and disclosures relating to construction projects. Conservatism is important. Um, Super microcomputer, as I mentioned, um, is an example of a revenue recognition case. They got into some trouble in that case where the CEO was pushing for quarterly earnings and quarterly revenue for several quarters. And then what the SEC saw and what they alleged were some revenue recognition improprieties where super micro was um, shipping uh, computer hardware that was unaccepted, unauthorized, taking revenue from it. Um, they were shipping to a warehouse in certain cases that were not a customer warehouse uh, that, that, that required some additional um, shipment to get to the customer. Again, unaccepted orders being recognized as revenue. And then lastly, for Supermicro, they had an additional uh, cooperative marketing arrangement with their downstream distributors that provided a rebate to downstream distributors who would market their products. That rebate allowed Supermicro and encouraged Supermicro to take a liability to put a reserve on the books with the expectation that certain of those rebates would be taken. And then the SEC identified unrelated expenses being taken down and offset against that liability, that reserve set up for cooperative marketing rebate. So a bit of earnings management in that case as well. Uh, power solution, again, another revenue recognition case. That was a hot area for SEC enforcement. It was a Chicago engine manufacturer conducting a bill and hold scheme, as the SEC described it. They were Booking sales, booking revenue, booking AR, they weren't shipping the engine. So note to the accountants in the room, uh, if you have any engine, engine uh, manufacturing clients, be sure to check the warehouse, make sure the engines have shipped. Non-GAAP metrics is um, a hot area. Wells Fargo, we know about that. That was a big uh, case, a big scandal. They were touting um, what they called a core element of their business, which were sales to existing customers. Okay, and what we now know is that the sales to existing customers um, were uh, resulting in, or in actuality, were unauthorized account openings, number one, and number two, unauthorized transactions in those accounts. So that non-GAAP metric turned out to be uh, a 10B5 fraud charge against Wells Fargo. BMW was, um, was touting a metric they called US retail sales. And they said, our US retail sales put us above Audi, above Mercedes. Uh, we are the top luxury car manufacturer in the US. What they didn't disclose was that they um, were encouraging their distributors and their dealers to convert certain retail cars um, to loaners. And they were taking credit for that as a part of their US retail sales, which obviously they were not. In addition, in that single metric U.S. retail sales, they had certain um, U.S. retail sales that they kept in what they called a bank. And they didn't record them in that statistic U.S. retail sales until they needed to, until they wanted to, um, to put themselves above again, Audi, again, above Mercedes in a particular period to say, look, we continue to be the top U.S. retailer in our segment. Um, Last one I'll touch on, and, and I'm moving kind of quickly uh, because we're getting close to the top of the hour, but Bosch Health was an interesting one. They touted same store sales growth um, in the sales of their pharmaceutical products. What they didn't disclose was that a significant portion of what they called same store sales were sales to an online pharmacy that Bosch Health set up funded and financially supported. So query whether that should have been consolidated as a variable interest entity. In any event, they were not properly um, crediting those sales as what they call double digit same store sales growth. Next slide, if you would. 
Um, in terms of cooperation, I'll just touch on this very quickly. What earns you cooperation, and we saw this with BMW and Transamerica in 2020, um, is number one, you identify the problem yourself. You voluntarily self-disclose to the agency. You remediate the problem, which involves individual remediation as well as systemic remediation, if appropriate. And then you ultimately cooperate with the staff of the SEC in their investigation. And I will tell you, particularly as it relates to the whistleblower cases that we were talking about, those cases don't just come randomly to the SEC. Usually, it is um, something that the company has some indicia of to begin with. A complaint was raised internally. Um, someone told the company this might be an issue or they know about it through other means. And those are the cases that companies need to be very thoughtful about, very proactive about. I'm helping a company right now who's faced off with the SEC and DOJ. Well, we're able to say to the SEC and the DOJ, thank you for bringing this to our attention. We knew about it already. It came in through our investigative tip line. We investigated it thoroughly. We hired outside counsel. We remediated it. Um, and here we are. We can tell you all about it. That's a much better position for a company to be in when facing an SEC inquiry than the alternative where you have to scramble, investigate something for the first time, or even worse, your investigation to begin with wasn't thorough, in which case your credibility with the agency will be lost. Next slide. And again, okay, so um, some key takeaways and, and um, then happy to take some, some questions if we have any time, but tips, complaints, we've talked about that. Companies need to focus on these when they have an opportunity to address them um, at, at, the, uh, at the outset. Data analytics, I mentioned the fact that companies um, are getting tips submitted and, and investigations are being initiated on the basis of things like earnings per share relative to your peers, other financial metrics. The SEC can use its own algorithms. They can take tips from outside sources who are running algorithms. They can compare your financial metrics to your peers. They can compare your financial metrics to prior years. And you need to have an explanation for those changes or any deviations or material differences between you and your peers. Um, and you can also do checks of those metrics yourself to see if there are exposures and, and there might be areas that, that create vulnerabilities for you. And then lastly, um, I'll just touch on that last bullet and then I'll close in the interest of time, but uh, non-GAAP financial metrics. Conservatism is called for, it continues to be a significant focus area for the SEC. So let me stop there. We're at the top of the hour. Happy to take any, any questions from folks and I'll turn it back to Chip. Great. Thanks, Gray. And your information is on the screen. So if folks do have uh, other questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Gray at any time. And that includes Miriam and Valerie as well. Gray, uh, lots of good stuff there. I took away from your talk that uh, if you get into a situation, it's like my daddy used to say, if you mess up, fess up, right? It'll get you much better credit uh, with the SEC. In many circumstances, that that is the right approach, but it is a tough analysis. It, uh, certainly. Uh, there's no law that says you have to self-disclose outside a False Claims Act um, circumstance. So it's, it's a tough analysis, but in many circumstances, it, it can be uh, the preferred approach. Perfect. Well, a great thank you for your time today and Miriam and Valerie as well. Thank you for your time. Great discussion, appreciate it. Uh, just a note for the, uh, for the attendees, CPE certificates will be sent by email to all of you uh, within two weeks. Uh, but if you attended today by a phone only, please send an email to Jay Lemansky, that's Jen Lemansky at pkftexas.com, indicating that you'd like to receive CPE credit for this webinar. Additionally, the recording of this webinar will be posted on the PKF Texas YouTube channel, uh, so you can check it out there. But if you're looking for CPA, please be advised that watching the recording doesn't necessarily get you CPE. Uh, when this webinar ends in a few moments, you will receive a pop-up with a link to an evaluation. If you'll take a few moments to provide your feedback as well as share additional topics you'd like us to cover in future seminars, we would appreciate it. Your feedback is invaluable to us and helps us design future sessions. This link will also be provided in a follow-up email on Saturday. And with that, on behalf of PKF Texas and all of us here, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Have a great day. 
Thank you for watching this recording of our Zoom webinar. A quick reminder that watching this video will not qualify you for CPE credit. For more information about PKF Texas's upcoming webinars, contact Jay Lemansky at pkftexas.com and stay tuned for future topics.